afternoon, everyone. I'm Jamelia Davis, Director for Strategic Initiatives and External Relations here at the Belk Center. On behalf of the Belk Center team, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Dallas Herring Lecture. We are thrilled that you have chosen to spend your afternoon with us in both the Zoom and YouTube worlds. Here's what to expect from our time together today. In the first part of our time this afternoon, we will hear greetings from education leaders from across the state and our featured speaker, Dr. Pam Edinger. There will be a short break that gives you an opportunity to let the thought provoking points sink in. Following the break, our College of Education Dean, Marianne Danowitz, will present the IE Reedy Award. We will spend the last hour of our time together diving into a panel discussion about the lecture topic and facilitate an audience Q&A. As you can see, we have a great program prepared for you. Finally, we have a number of ways you can engage with us. Whatever platform you are using to join us, we encourage you to join our virtual conversations on Twitter using hashtag DHL2020 and tagging us at NC State Belk. Let's get started. Please join me in welcoming our Chancellor, Randy Woodson. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm thrilled to be with you virtually. We hold uh, the Dallas Herring Lecture every year, but I think this is the first time we've ever done it virtually. So uh, there's a lot of first times these days, but we're thrilled to have you all with us today. You know, we have a very exciting program plan for you, as you've heard. And I, again, I wanna thank you for giving us the, the, the benefit of your time. You know, Dallas Herring was an exceptional leader in North Carolina. And uh, he, he led with the mantra of total education for all of North Carolinians. And today there are hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of people across our state that had broadened access to higher education because of his vision. And NC State University honors Mr. Herring's legacy by hosting this annual event, the Dallas Herring Lecture, and inviting some of the nation's top community college leaders to speak on critical topics. And uh, there's none more critical than we face today. Today's Dallas Herring Lecture is of course supported by the John M. Belk Endowment, uh, which is also generously supporting our colleges our College of Education's Belk Center uh, for Community College Leadership and Research. And many, many thanks to MC Belk Pylon and the John M. Belk Endowment for their generous gifts that make today and make so much of what we do at NC State and the College of Education possible. Our lecture today is entitled Insights from the Pandemic uh, and believe me, I need a lot of insights from the pandemic. Um, it, going on with the title, Insights from the Pandemic, the Reckoning and the Hope of Our Nation's Community Colleges. And nothing could be further from the truth. It, it is so true to think about everything community colleges do for us across the country, but it, particularly when we're thinking about critical times in our country's history, like the pandemic has created for so many lives and what community colleges can do to lift up uh, people's lives across our state. As, as we at NC State plan for our future, it's clear the university will continue strengthening its partnerships with North Carolina's community colleges. And we're very proud of those partnerships that exist today. Several of our NC State strategic planning task forces this past summer explicitly recognized the importance of our community college partnerships and have recommended that the university expand and strengthen those partnerships to give so many first generation and other students across our great state access uh, and affordability to higher education. And expanding and strengthening our community college partnerships has been a street strategic priority uh, for some time at NC State. In fact, in 2018, we launched our Community College Collaborative, or what we affectionately call C3. It keeps the chancellor focused when he can use acronyms um, to increase our outreach to rural communities and to low to moderate income uh, graduates and first generation 
uh, college students as well. And of course, one of our best examples of our expanding partnerships with North Carolina Community Colleges is the Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research at NC State. Um, in addition to supporting the College of Education's doctoral program, and we're very proud of the number of community college leaders across the state that have come through the doors of NC State and benefited from our education. But this program also provides executive leadership development and robust research to support evidence-based decisions for improving student success in community colleges. So it is in this spirit of partnering with North Carolina's community colleges that I welcome to you this afternoon's Dallas Herring Lecture. Now I'm very pleased to turn the microphone or the virtual platform over to Audrey Jager, uh, the Executive Director of the Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research. Audrey, it's all yours. Thank you, Chancellor Woodson. Your leadership and vision empower NC State to continue to execute its chartered mission as a land grant institution to serve the citizens of our state. And we very much appreciate the value you place on a strong community college university partnership. We know this relationship is critical for the success of our students in North Carolina and across the country. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm AJ Jager, Executive Director of the Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research and the W. Dallas Herring Distinguished Professor at NC State. We're excited to have nearly 1,400 colleagues registered today to listen, learn, and engage. We have many colleagues connecting with us across North Carolina, but we also welcome colleagues from California, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, North Dakota, Texas, Virginia, and Wisconsin, just to name a few. And I'm joining you today from Raleigh, North Carolina. I wanna recognize that indigenous peoples have called this region home for thousands of years. Our campus and our surrounding community is located on the land that the Enos, Okaniche, Shikoris, and Sisipahas originally called home. Today, North Carolina has the largest native population east of the Mississippi River, including eight sovereign American Indian tribes. They are the Lumbee, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Halawa Saponi, the Kohari, the Saponi, the Waccamaw Suwon, the Meharan, and the Okaniche Band of the Saponi Nation. These nations are the descendants of the original inhabitants of this land and are working to preserve and teach others about their culture. We are grateful for their many contributions to our community. And I'm appreciative of my native colleagues who belong to these tribes and helped with this land acknowledgement. At our event today, NC State recognizes W. Dallas Herring's legacy by hosting the annual Dallas Herring Lecture, inviting, as Chancellor Woodson said, the nation's top community college leaders to speak on issues critical to focusing on student success. Herring's transformative vision and tireless work culminated in the inception of North Carolina's community college system. Herring's life of public service began at age 23 when he was elected mayor of his hometown of Rose Hill, North Carolina in 1939 and continued through a remarkable 22 year record as the chairman of the State Board of Education under five different governors. It was during his time at the board that North Carolina's community college system was established. At the Belk Center, we're honored to continue Herring's legacy through our work to develop and sustain exceptional community college leaders who are committed to advancing college access, the social and economic mobility of their college students, and the economic competitiveness of their region. As part of our program today, you're going to hear from four community college presidents, including our featured speaker, President Pam Edinger of Bunker Hill Community College in Massachusetts, and respondents, Presidents Avis Proctor of Harper College in Illinois, President Candy Dietemeyer of Central Piedmont Community College in North Carolina, and President William Serrata of the El Paso County Community College District in Texas. I have the privilege today to welcome the interim president of the North Carolina Community College System, William Carver. President Carver is a former president of Nash Community College, alumnus of NC State, and supportive friend of the Belk Center. 
His deep commitment to North Carolina's community colleges is strong, and he works tirelessly to connect problems to solutions. President Carver has developed strong and enduring relationships across business, industry, public schools, and within the community college system. And we're grateful he could be with us today to introduce our featured speaker. And I will turn the virtual program to Dr. Carver. Thank you, Dr. Yeager. It's an honor to be here today. I'm Bill Carver again, interim president of North Carolina Community College System. Prior to this role, you heard uh, Dr. Jager say that I spent time at Nash Community College just east of Raleigh. I am an NC State alum and very proud the university has continued to invest resources in supporting North Carolina Community Colleges. The Belk Center's uh, partnership with North Carolina Community College System has fueled momentum focusing, in, focusing on equ equitable student outcomes through a long leg legacy of doctoral education, creating the next generation of community college leaders. The university also provides a continuing executive leadership program, opportunities for research and evaluation that address many, many critical student issues. There is no better indicator of NC State's commitment to community colleges than the annual commitment to host the Dallas Herring Lecture Series. As already has been mentioned, Dallas Herring laid the groundwork for our system. What a tribute to his legacy. This year, I've had the added pleasure of introducing our featured speaker, speaker Dr. Pam Edinger. Dr. Edinger is one of the nation's leading community college thought leaders. Pam Edinger is president of Bunker Hill Community College, the largest of 15 community colleges in Massachusetts. Dr. Edinger began her career at, uh, in tenure at Bunker Hill in 2013. She previously served as president of Moore Park Community College in Southern California. Her service in that community college movement spans more than 25 years with senior posts in academic student affairs, communication policy and executive leadership. Dr. Edinger serves as the chair for the Community College National Reform Network, Achieving the Dream. She is also honored in 2016 by the Obama White House as champion of change. She earned a bachelor's degree in English from Barnard College in New York City and a master's and doctorate in Japanese literature from Columbia University. On behalf of the faculty, staff, administrators, and the presidents of the 58 community colleges represented here today, as well as the hundreds of colleagues across the United States, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Dr. Pam Edinger whose lecture is sure to inspire and motivate future action. Well, thank you, Dr. Carver and, and Chancellor Woodson and, um, and Dr. Jager. And thank you to the Belk Center uh, for inviting me to deliver the William Dallas Herring Lecture today, um, honoring a visionary who has shaped the North Carolina Community College system. In his 1966 speech to the legislature, I discovered this passage that still resonates so deeply half a century later. Dr. Herring said, the only valid philosophy for North Carolina is the philosophy of total education, a belief in the incomparable worth of all human beings whose talents must develop to the fullest possible degree. That is why the doors to the institutions in North Carolina's system of community colleges must never be closed. We must take the people where they are and carry them as far as they can go within the assigned functions of the system. Dr. Dallas Herring was insistent on the potential of all beings to contribute to the progress of humankind, regardless of origin and regardless of status. And it is in the spirit of Dr. Herring's abiding belief that I offer this lecture today. So my talk today is about insights gained from the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past eight months, I have witnessed the disintegration of systems that I have worked to strengthen over the last quarter century. I have seen my students and their communities in desperate straits seemingly put there overnight. 
Yet through this darkness of the pandemic and the clouded history of racism and systemic deprivations, I also recognize a transformation in our community college movement. A transformation that presents a new possibility in the character of the community college and a new social contract with the people. So to put my observations in context, we might travel back to a moment before the pandemic, the before time, when the student success movement dominated the conversations in community colleges. And in that time, two questions occupied a lot of our thoughts. One, how, how can we improve student persistence and increase degree completion? And two, how can we close the achievement gaps in our marginalized populations? The student success movement had grappled with these two questions for over two decades. The struggle has produced conceptual frameworks and an abundance of pedagogical and technical solutions from assessment and accountability in the early 2000s, the college scorecard and the White House completion agenda in the following decade to the more recent introduction of the guided pathways. At the heart of this research is an aspiring vision that has animated community college scholars and practitioners everywhere. It speaks to the optimism that all students can succeed and that the attainment gap is bridgeable and that students of color, first generation students and students caught in generational poverty can attain academic success. It also implied a promise, a social contract that academic success will lead to a social and economic mobility. We believe that solving the problems of engagement and completion is what stands between us and lives transformed. The urgency of the student success movement was also fueled by the pressing need for an educated workforce to meet the demands of an information and technology-driven technology economy. Community colleges have become the logical institution for workforce education and training to ensure global competitiveness of our nation. So as the student success movement grew, it became increasingly clear that there's a significant mismatch between who our students are and the assumption built into the metrics being used to measure their success. This mismatch contributes to a false narrative about community college performance and the students themselves. The mistaken expectation that community colleges simply replicate the first two years of a traditional four-year education and that students behave and live similarly to traditional undergrads, this skew the performance metrics and cast community college persistently into a deficit light. This deficit narrative added to the unrealistic expectations about college readiness and economic mobility becomes the basis of what I call a double bind, one that traps our students in mismatch expectations and our educators in a constant battle for student success under measures that are barely achievable because of funding constraints. Researching these questions about effectiveness led us to refine our data gathering analysis. The concept of a culture of evidence took hold during the early 2000s and grew over the next decade. Anxiety over the attainment gap and economic mobility moved President Obama to establish the college completion agenda in 2009 to increase credential completion. And he also convened the first White House summit on community colleges in 2010. After that, the student success movement entered an extraordinarily vibrant period and solutions for closing the achievement gap flooded and enriched our field. You know the strategies and the experts well. They included achieving the dream, completing college America, completion by design, AACC's 21st century commission, guided pathways, Jobs for the Future Student Success Centers, Texas' own version of Student Success Centers, CCRC's pro prolific research agenda, and the policies and practices resulting from national foundations funded projects. But despite the substantive, fund substantive funding and the intense reform efforts in the field, the needle moved only modestly during the first, first decade. 
A most valuable insight from this period and a most frustrating one is the critical understanding that community college is deeply entangled with social, racial, and economic forces. And the effects of these systems are interdependent and impossible to tease apart. The context of student success is wider than the classroom and the academic environment. And effective programs like CUNY's ASAP program required not only consistent funding, but intentional and integrated strategies to dismantle barriers for students, barriers that are created by the dysfunctional, but clearly interlinked systems. It was in the midst of this push for answers about student attainment that COVID-19 pandemic came into the scene in March, 2020. Like a flash of lightning in the night, the pandemic revealed all the cracks and fissures hidden in the landscape and gave us a stark and unsparing look at the cavernous wealth and attainment gap before us and our black and brown urban communities in the immigrant communities and in our poor white communities in the rural regions. And while the struggle of these communities are not new to any of us educators in the field, the depth of the needs as well as their systemic and entrenched nature now shapes and informs a national conversation as never before. The lightning bore witness to disintegrations in the hometowns of our students. At Boston's Bunker Hill Community College, my community college, like many large urban schools, 70% of our learners are students of color and two thirds are adults. 77% are living in the lowest two quintile of income and some experiencing generational poverty. Three quarters of them work and many of them full time, and yet they're the working poor. 54% are food insecure and 14% are homeless. More than half of my students are parents and half of those parents are single moms. Our students are family strong and economically fragile. And when money runs short, college gives way to family, to jobs and to the urgency of survival. We all know that they walk a tight rope balancing daily survival and the aspirations for economic advancement. Many of our students are also low wage frontline essential workers, as well as first responders and entry level healthcare workers. Their jobs made them susceptible to infection and further eroded their resilience as we weather the outbreak. It is no accident that COVID hotspots in Massachusetts and elsewhere coincided with our communities of color served by our colleges where poor public health and public education outcomes are intertwined. The systemic deprivations predicated on race, on class, and the persistent choice of private profit over public good has eroded our social contract in related sectors, in elementary and secondary education, in housing and transportation, in public health, in generational care. The hope of us lifting our students above the gap and forwarding their economic mobility becomes fainter when the support network is frayed in so many other places. But here's the light amidst the darkness. As much as the pandemic revealed the failure of social and economic systems, it has also shown us a radical transformation in the nature of community colleges, one that deserved greater acknowledgement and certainly provides hope for the next stage of student success work. In our deep concern with social inequities over time, community colleges, our colleges, have built infrastructure or brought social agencies onto campuses to compensate for the lack of support in individual families and in the community. We built libraries and study commons, computer labs with Wi-Fi, dining commons, clinics, food pantries, community gathering spaces, offices of emergency services, emergency housing, mental health counseling, and other services to keep our students connected. Community college education is no longer a standalone. We are the social and education hub for our communities. This was validated in March when we closed our doors on our campuses and without a hub to call home, our students were adrift. So initially when we pivoted 1700 sections of classes from on ground to virtual, we scrambled to provide students with Wi-Fi, Chromebooks, laptops, food from our free food pantry. 
But despite the effort to equip our students, close to 800 of our students went silent. And our survey with these students told us that logistical challenges, the digital gap, and the separation from social support are among the main reasons for their disengagement. And for our young Black men, the disengagement was even more drastic with an additional 20% gap compared to the rest of the survey group. As did Bunker Hill, community colleges across the nation have picked up the responsibility as a social service and education hub to further economic mobility, yet the systemic defunding of public, public, yet the systemic defunding of public education, which began over a decade ago with the Great Recession, has stripped what were already meager budget appropriations. The need to shoulder the high cost for keeping displaced students equipped and engaged continues to mount. The public funding has certainly followed the troubling hierarchy that places community colleges at the bottom of the higher ed sector. Yet it is unmistakable that a just and equitable recovery from COVID, one that restores the cultural identity and socioeconomic infrastructure of our communities depend heavily on us. There is no other sector that has a better chance to achieve equity, economic vibrancy and social justice. It has been a long game as we watched the federal government and the states, one waiting for the other to take substantive funding actions to shore up the community colleges. We wait while our students and our colleges break under the weight. Let's turn our, our, our talk a bit to the college mobility narrative and the double bind. So beyond the immediate challenges of our students, the pandemic forced us to examine another persistent and I believe insidious storyline that has defined higher education. And that's the storyline of meritocracy. There's a hierarchy, so the narrative says, with the IV plus on top and the community colleges at the base. If an individual have talent and merit, they can climb to the top. And the climb to the summit is both a triumph of grit and moral character, particularly if you're poor and particularly if you're a person of color. And the arrival of the student is also at once a rejection of an unwanted cultural status and an affirmation of the higher ed class system. The story of merit is further connected to the rewards of job and economic advancement. The reverse narrative is also alive and well. Should you fail to partake in college, you're without ambition. Should you fail to ascend, you're without merit. And should you fail to advance economically due to the first two failures, a signals a flaw in your character. And should you persist over generations, the flaws are ascribed to families and your communities. The false narratives are often racialized and gendered, from Ronald Reagan's welfare queens to the unwed mothers on SNAP and the immigrant overburdening the public charge. The attitude of the American public regarding the poor is woven tightly into the sector of higher education. These unspoken tenants inform a set of higher education mobility narratives that were created by some of the most important education legislatures, legislations after World War II. Uh, Dr. Dr. Michael Collins of Jobs for the Future identifies three milestones as the GI Bill of 1944, the Truman Commission of 1946, and the Higher Education Act of 1965. They were meant to broaden access to education and home ownership and are the foundations of the education mobility narrative. Yet this narrative has not held true for Blacks, for people of color, and for people in poverty. Whole communities are victimized by their inability to access programs that were meant to improve their lot. When they do attempt it, and fail in large numbers due to the lack of appropriate support, they are labeled talentless, meritless, and of questionable character. The community colleges created to serve these communities in need are trapped in this double bind as well. We attempt a Herculean task every day of restoring equity to marginalized communities by becoming the social and education hubs. And when we turn out low performance due to the lack of support and funding, were put in our place, stigmatized, and the funding is withdrawn as a leverage to improve. 
our students are damned if we don't, and we are damned if we do. When the lightning of the pandemic struck, the world was transfixed by the disinvestment it saw. COVID made us look, and the anti-Black racism protests of the summer ensure that our gaze remains steady to reassess the past and to recognize our nation's exclusionary impulse. The pandemic also confirmed what educators have known, that curricular reform in the classroom alone are not enough to help students persist, and engagement is closely tied to the perception of belonging. And fostering belonging requires a complex web of assurances of physical safety, of financial survival, of basic needs, of social connection, of cultural respect, and of intellectual curiosity. The hub, the term that I have used to envision the transformational structure that our nation's community college are becoming may just be that place of promise. At the hub, we're already writing a new social contract with our students. And at the hub, we could imagine and initiate a just and equitable recovery from these chaotic days. While the pandemic ripped gaping holes in our already weakened social fabric, it also brought to light our transformation from a silo institution to an integrated social hub. We have found coherence in conjuring up a food pantry next to the classrooms and labs, an emergency office next to the gym, housing on campus for the homeless, childcare centers, and more. We have become holistic, equity-minded institutions that promoted community engagement, economic mobility, and ultimately, and ultimately social equity. We have renewed a fray social contract and are becoming a better iteration of ourselves at the beginning of this new century. As we listen closely during the pandemic, we also hear a shift in the way that we ask questions about persistence and success. Perhaps spending two decades delving into student data and witnessing our students' arduous journeys, our views have matured. Our gaze is shifting from our students' deficits to the readiness of the institution to see our students' assets. As one of our deans at Bunker Hill is fond of saying, our students are not broken, they're navigating a broken system. We must now ask how our institutions have been complicit in the system breakdown. How do we affect change in our own hearts and minds to create a sense of a place for our learners and deliver love from the hub? So let's see if we can start with this. To know our students in the context of their lived experiences, their histories and their complexities, as well as their data files. We dismantle negative narratives, all of them, and you know what they are. We identify cultural wealth and honor the heritages and the cultural capital that our students bring and help them apply these strengths and service to their learning. We recognize hashtag real college as contemporary higher education and discard the traditional assumptions about college as a rite of passage for young men and women. And we should know the physical, emotional, and financial implications of your policies for adults. And we know who we are in our guidance to our students. We do not assume that the experiences that shaped us as college students decades ago are still valid for our students. They carry with them their own unique background, their cultures, and their lived experiences. So in our wish to see our communities revive, we must acknowledge that economic recoveries have most often failed communities of color. The Federal Reserve Bank of Boston noted that eight years after the Great Recession in the city of Boston and across the nation, the average net worth of blocks in Boston was $8. Someone thought that was a typo, but it was not. Compared to whites at 2,400, compared to whites at $247,500, the Hispanic groups fared better by the thinnest of margins hovering at under $3,000. This time around, there's a call for more just and equitable recovery. The Brookings Institute calls for, quote, a rebuilding better effort that includes business stimulus, quality jobs, and infrastructure investments in black and brown neighborhoods and communities of underrepresented populations. And at the heart of the just recovery effort 
must be a multi-sector commitment towards a shared vision for, just, for economic and social justice. It is perhaps in this new vision of recovery that we see the next iteration of our future. In becoming a hub of services, our colleges have been building this just and recovery in microcosm. To promote greater economic mobility of our learners, we link multiple sectors, we activate public, private, and philanthropic partnerships, and we build a community with many identities with a sense of belonging for all. As we expand our vision of the hub, we can imagine that even as we are hubs to our own communities, we're also part of a larger collective and a larger ecosystem that connects states and regions, a broader healing ecology that begins to right the systemic neglect that has persisted for so long. But similar to our efforts to develop a culture of evidence a decade ago, growing a culture of collaboration is contingent upon our institution's habit of mind and operational logistics. And as community colleges, we often lack the business infrastructure and the academic flexibility to build deeply entwined partnerships. But the work is too vast and too complex for us to go it alone. The hub, in essence, must be an assemblage of all the new parts to better serve our students. We must deconstruct what we have and invite in new components and integrate. Dismantling well entrenched structure, it's a really painstaking task. But, and, it, and it requires the changes in mindset to be open to sharing what might mean negotiating control over traditional academic grounds from curriculum and programming to space and even the hours of operation. Leadership at every level is critical to laying the groundwork for change and how we as leaders tell the story of a new hope or a new hub must be part of our leadership practices. And as we commit our college to new integrations, we must invite the community to join and bring every sector into the hub. The possibilities are endless, advisory boards, curriculum and training, cultural events, internships, faculty exchange, equipment and knowledge sharing, exhibits and retail spaces, incubation shops, just bring them all in. And as we build the assemblage, we will see the force of collective impact where the intentions of the various parts come together and hold our students secure and lead them to the experiences and to completion. The strategy is particularly effective when it's guided by values of your college. Our strategy at Bunker Hill was grounded in equity. So when we told our partners that our students cannot afford to take up free internships, State Street Bank Boston converted all of their part-time hiring to paid internships for us and put aside over 30 slots for our students. Similarly, the Boston Venture Capitalists Association challenge our tech sector in Boston's male dominance by recruiting a dozen post-traditional interns of color and women for companies. The Hack Diversity Partnership is now in its third year and all the interns have landed jobs. In that same value guided sense, we have opened our doors to local and national community-based organizations like the Advising Corps, U Aspire, Bottom Line, Single Stops, they all added value and technical innovations beyond what our college-based services could provide. Our wide open door is a collective impact strategy. It is a civic leadership strategy and ultimately a safety net and student success strategy. We documented more than 400 relationships at various levels within our community and the swirl of activities within our hub, we continue to seek the right pieces to assemble solution for students. Early college in Massachusetts is a good example of a collaborative, equitable strategy that erases the deficit narratives that surrounded marginalized students. Over two dozen early colleges now exist in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have discarded the old pattern of skimming top performing students um, in favor of an equity approach. The early results are extraordinary. Early college students are 20 percentage points more likely to enroll in college. Black early college students are 38 percentage points more likely, and Latinx students are 24 percentage point more likely to enter college uninterrupted. And the power of partners is evidence here. In addition to the modest initial state budget investment, the Smith Family Foundation's multi-million, multi-year investment scale and sustain the pilot for us, and feel experiences with local industries and services provided by area nonprofits 
were all part of the assemblage that came together under the community college hub. And symbiotic relationships with industry provided some of the best examples of the hub assembly. And for decades, we've been doing it. Toyota, General Motors, Chrysler, all embedded industry-specific technician training programs at our community colleges. And the ally health and the business sectors have built community clinics, childcare centers, student bank branches, and other entrepreneurial operations tied to academic programs. And right there in North Carolina, Blue Ridge Community College pulled together leaders in the cast and machining industry, a, ph a philanthropic foundation, the community college system, county government, and faculty to launch the SimTech lab to train workers. And close to 200 students have come through the center supporting the vibrant dye machining industry in your region. The sweeping investments recently announced by large corporate foundations to uplift community and regions are also excellent opportunities to form new collectives. JP Morgan Chase invested over $75 million globally to address career readiness and future of work with community colleges at the center of building pathways. This is a portion of a $30 billion commitment they've made to advance racial equity and drive an inclusive economic recovery. We need to be part of that. Beyond the month of, between the month of June and October 2020, Bank of America, Pfizer, Salesforce, and the Business Roundtable all make commitments to jobs and resources and strategic directions that would advance equity in health, education, finance, employment, housing, and the justice system. We need to be part of that. Again and again, we see widening recognition that lifting of communities must come from a collective and not any one system alone. And this emerging understanding and the rising support provided hope for those of us working in the community colleges. Our journey in the past few decades has been lonely, it has been impoverished, and it has been arduous. It is critical, however, to remember that the equity lesson, well, it's critical to remember the equity lessons of the GI Bill and the Truman Commission as we seek solutions with multiple partners, right? Unless we're deliberate about dismantling barriers and false narratives, we risk inviting everyone to the table and yet ultimately leaving behind the same marginalized communities and perpetuating the gaps that we see today. Our recovery must resist the desire to impose. And our new vision must be generative. We must seek to individualize and to democratize and to place our students and their community at the heart of the effort. The perspective must shift within this vision and agency must be returned to its rightful place, to our communities that we serve and to the learner. And I believe the crack of lightning that was COVID really did light up the inhumane conditions in our communities. And difficult as it is to witness the misery, I think we will seize this moment of clarity to think anew about our role as colleges in our community and how we can be agents of change in the coming decade. And I invite you to explore the changing future of the hub with me and see us as a place of convergence, a place of revolution, and the home of a new social promise with our students to honor their history, to activate their potential, and truly this time to claim their place in the world. Thank you, everyone. And I'd like to turn this back over to Audrey and Jamila. Hi, everyone. Pam, please accept our deepest gratitude for your time, vulnerability, and wisdom that you've shared with us. Your insights are destined to motivate us to look for new ways to collaborate, refine old ways, and promote equitable student success at community colleges across the country. Additionally, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our partners at NNC for sponsoring Karen Sterling as our graphic recorder. We'll be happy to share what she has recorded for us visually at a later date. As we prepare for our brief stretch break, we welcome you to continue engaging with us on Twitter and prepare for the audience Q&A. If you are joining us through the Zoom webinar, we welcome you to submit your questions for the panelists using the Q&A control. If you are joining us through our live stream on YouTube, we invite you to text ASK NOW to 73224. 
Enjoy your stretch break. We'll see you in a few moments for the IE Reedy Award presentation and the riveting panel discussion. The foundation of the work at the Belk Center rests with our North Carolina Community College presidents. We know that each of the 58 community colleges has unique offerings, has a unique community, has unique needs. We support the presidents in their efforts to improve student success outcomes in North Carolina. In December of 2019, we hosted Sandy Schugert, who is the president of Valencia uh, College in Florida. Follow up to the lecture, we we're actually able to provide individual level data to all of the community college presidents. We were able to show them how their students were doing who transferred um, from their community college to UNC um, system institutions. And importantly, we're able to disaggregate that those data um, to be able to look at how the patterns differ by historically underserved groups. In our last symposium in March, we had more than 40 presidents attend with their teams and they, they made some extraordinary action plans to increase service to students who have historically been underserved by higher education. Since March and the onset of the pandemic, presidents have changed their action plans to meet the new needs and the Belk Center continues to support them by connecting them to additional resources. Faculty at community colleges had to act quickly to transition services to students from seated courses to an online format. Spearheaded by Belk Center faculty scholars Dr. Michelle Bartlett and Dr. Carol Warren, the center launched and delivered support support and services for community college faculty. Over 500 individuals engaged with us through webinars, live Zoom sessions, and instructional videos. Our work has focused on improving student success outcomes for historically underserved populations in North Carolina. We're using a framework developed by the College Excellence Program at the Aspen Institute to examine our doctoral program. And the first processes we examined were the recruitment process, and the admissions process. After looking at the past data, it was evident that our program and our students were using the GRE scores to create an inequitable outcome. To replace testing, we've created an admissions process that allows us to know the students, including an intensive interview weekend that takes a holistic approach. When our colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Greenlee, saw an opportunity to elevate the voices of Presidents Gatewood, Senegal, and Rouse, three Black community college presidents, we offered to support and gather feedback and develop a report. From there, we gathered a group of key stakeholders and decision makers to reflect on the information that we were able to gather. We recognize there's room for improvement in elevating our understanding and explicitly integrating racial equity in our work. The Belk Center is prioritizing our commitment to racial equity by breaking down the systemic barriers that exist in society. Welcome back. If you were able, we hope you enjoyed hearing more about the Belk Center's work in the last year. To learn more, we invite you to review our annual report that is posted on our website. Next, we will move into our recognition of this year's IE Reedy Award recipient. Please join me in welcoming our College of Education Dean, Dean Marianne Danowitz, to make this presentation. Good evening. And thank you for joining us for this important lecture, especially during a time when I know you continue to be very busy and have much on your minds. It is now my privilege to present the IE Reedy Award. This award honors the memory and legacy of Dr. IE Reedy, who envisioned and worked toward a community college system that would provide total education for students and expand educational opportunities. I am pleased to recognize this year's recipient, Dr. John D. Gossett. Dr. Gossett is president of Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College, and there aren't many people who know the community college system better than him. Dr. Gossett began his career in higher education 32 years ago after earning a marketing degree from the University of Tennessee and an MBA from Appalachian State University and later he earned his doctorate from NC State. He later joined McDowell Tech as Vice President for Learning and Student Services. And in 2016, he became the president of McDowell Tech. And in July of this year, he became the president of AB Tech 
Community College. In addition to his responsibilities as AB Tech's president, Dr. Gossett serves on numerous local, regional, and statewide boards and committees in support of community college education and economic development initiatives. His professional interests include community and small business development, as well as leadership development for staff and students. Throughout his career, Dr. Gossett has been known for his servant's heart. As interim system president Bill Carver earlier shared with me, Dr. Gossett leads with compassion and champions students, ensuring they have what they need inside and outside of the classroom to be successful. He addresses issues like food insecurity, housing, transportation, healthcare, and other things that too often get in the way of student success and that affects so many residents in counties that his community college serves. His motivation and passion for making a difference in the lives of Madison and Buncombe County residents is exemplary. He also exemplifies I.E. Reedy's vision for expanding educational opportunities. When recently asked why he chose the field of education by an Ed NC reporter, Dr. Gossett said, it's because education makes a difference for those who pursue it. The expectations are raised. The trajectory for entire families are changed for the better. I would add, as Dr. Gossett's life attests, entire communities can be changed for the better too. That's certainly the case for those communities where Dr. Gossett has served. Please join me in congratulating the 2020 recipient of the IE Reedy Award, Dr. John D. Gossett. Congratulations, Dr. Gossett. Very well deserved. I am absolutely uh, blown away by it, humbled, uh, knowing all of the great leaders that have come through NC State. Uh, it, it's just hard for me to uh, reconcile myself uh, to that, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I feel like Forrest Gump. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time, uh, really surrounded by outstanding people throughout my whole career. Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm proudest of the relationships that we've created and the students that we've helped uh, get through the community college industry and move on to bigger and better things, especially since most of my career has been at small rural community colleges, seeing those students uh, who didn't have a chance uh, for life reasons, uh, financial reasons, personal reasons, they stayed home and made their life there and that was their choice and that was great. And we made them uh, better citizens where they are and that's that's exciting for rural america and i'm proud to be a part of that well good afternoon uh congratulations to dr gossett uh on the ie reedy award uh he's done such great work at mcdowell tech uh, i'm confident he's doing great things at ab tech and I have so many funny stories uh, to share about him, but I'm gonna wait until we're all together and we have a drink in our hand to do so. I don't wanna break the decorum of this great event. I'm, uh, I'm Peter Hans, president of the University of North Carolina. And I like to say I'm a transfer president, uh, having served the community colleges in North Carolina before taking my credits to the university in August. So I have a particular deep appreciation for the Belk Center and its mission. I'm grateful to MC Belk Pylon, to Chancellor Woodson, Dean Danowitz, uh, Dr. Jager, uh, for their commitment to getting world-class research in the hands of those who need it, our great 58 community colleges uh, who lift so many up on a daily basis. AJ, I'm thrilled about your appointment as the Dallas Herring Distinguished Professor. I know that makes for a long introduction. You may need bigger business cards, but what a magnificent legacy to uphold. Uh, I know Dr. Herring would be especially proud of the work happening here at Belk, 
uh, to build stronger bonds between the community colleges and the universities. He always knew we were two systems with one goal. And I'm dedicated to continuing that commitment and enhancing it, if possible, by creating common course numbering at the University of North Carolina to save our transfer students time and money, helping them complete their studies. If we believe there is extraordinary talent in every part of this state and country, and I, I do, I know you do as well, we know it must be our community colleges that will lead the way in matching talent and opportunity. As Dr. Ettinger said, uh, that means looking at the promise our students possess, not at the preparation they may lack. That absence is temporary. The promise is real if we can develop their potential. So I'm very excited about our work together that lies ahead. Uh, ask you to please stay safe and well, and thank you so much. Welcome back to the 2020 Dallas Herring Lecture, and thank you, President Hans, uh, for your support. And congratulations to Dr. John Gossett for his career of service to North Carolina and receiving the IE Reedy Award. I have the good fortune of introducing our panel today. You all know Dr. Pam Edinger, president of Bunker Hill Community College and board chair for Achieving the Dream. Thank you, Pam, for your remarks. I was so stimulated by what you shared and in particular, the ways in which you directed us to that truth and reality of the systemic and intentional barriers faced by community college students. The catastrophic stresses you mentioned faced by students and co community colleges may seem too difficult to overcome, yet you also remind and affirm us that community colleges are places of revolution and the home of a new social promise. I know your work has stimulated thoughts in our panelists as well, so let's get right to sharing their perspectives. Our presidents on the panel today include Dr. Candy Dietemeyer of Central Piedmont Community College in North Carolina, Dr. William Serrata of the El Paso County Community College District in Texas, and Dr. Avis Proctor of Harper College in Illinois. Thank you all for serving as our respondents today. We're soliciting questions from Twitter and other social media outlets for each of you, but first, I want to ask for your key takeaway from President Edinger's lecture, those that resonate with you as a community college president. And we'll start with President Dietemeyer. Well, good afternoon. And thank you to Dr. Jager and the Belk Center and, and all of the supporters for having us here today. And first of all, um, to Dr. Edinger, um, Pam, I, my words and my heart just go out to you for capturing um, everything that we have endured probably in our history as community colleges. Uh, but certainly the last several months in terms of the effect that COVID and the pandemic has really had not only on our students, uh, but part of my reflection as I was preparing for today is we cannot forget the impact that it's had not only on our, our, on our organizations, but our faculty and our staff. And so, um, you know, as I just a real quick reflection, because I want to get my colleagues into the conversation as well, Dr. Jager, but you know, I want to take us really back to the very beginning few words uh, that Dr. Pam uh, shared with us, and that was around um, Dr. Dallas Herring. You know, typically, especially in North Carolina, we talk about that last statement that says, uh, take the people where they are and carry them as far as they can go. We put the emphasis on that one statement. But if you go back to kind of his speech to the North Carolina legislature and that subsequent interview, um, that Dr. Edinger pointed out, he really puts the emphasis on human beings. He puts it on the worth of who we are and who our students are. And he puts um, really uh, an inflection point about their immense capacity and possibility. And I heard that resonate as she talked about the capabilities of our students. Um, and I've never hidden the fact that I'm a community college graduate, that I'm the fifth of five children and I never thought I'd be a college president serving at one of our amazing institutions. And I never thought I'd see the fall like no other that we just experienced. So what we have endured um, in our narrative uh, in the last 10 months or eight months, I feel like it's been forever is real and it has resonated 
and it's more relevant to our conversation as community colleges across the nation. And so Pam, I thank you for lifting it up and I look forward to, to making some other reflections, but that was my initial takeaway. It's about the worth and capacity and capability of our students that we have to, uh, to be emboldened about um, as we move forward. Thank you, Candy, and thank you so much for being vulnerable yourself and for the work you do at CPCC. President Serrata, would you like to provide your takeaways? Well, thank you, Dr. Jager, Dr. Davis, Chancellor Woodson, and the entire North Carolina State team for ensuring that the lecture and panel have gone off without a hitch in this new and this not so new virtual environment. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me the privilege as well to sit on this panel along with these outstanding community college leaders, Dr. Harvest Proctor and Dr. Candy Dietermeyer. And to share my thoughts on another amazing leader, Dr. Pam Ettinger's outstanding lecture, one definitely worthy of its namesake, Dr. Dallas Herring. Regarding takeaways and narrowing to one or two, well, that's certainly a challenge, but, but I'll do my best. First, I, I'd like to touch on how Dr. Ettinger sets the stage regarding her observations of dealing with the pandemic over the last eight months as she described the dire situation that her students and community find themselves in. And I quote, these observations prompted much painful reflection and eventually research into the, the reasons for systemic failures in multiple sectors supporting the communities. Through the darkness of the pandemic, and the cloud history of racism and systemic deprivations, I witnessed not only the power of the community college movement, but the emergence of a new transformation, a transformation that promises a new vision of community in community college and a new social contract with the people. These words early in the lecture struck me both through the powerful use of language via the storm motif that was utilized throughout the lecture, but also the rebirth and transformation of our sector of higher education by solidifying the community part of our name via a new social contract with the students we serve. The second takeaway that I gleaned from Dr. Edinger's lecture was the interconnectedness of our students' success with our respective institutions and the reality of the interdependence that academic success has with the lives they lead daily outside of the walls of our community college campuses. The challenges of everyday life, food insecurity, homelessness, childcare, transportation, and many others, which have been affected by the systemic deinvestment, de de deinvestment, disinvestment, pardon me, in social safety nets have forced community colleges to step up and provide not only academic support, but indeed social support to facilitate the student success and closing of the equity gaps we strive for within our colleges. Dr. Edinger eloquently describes this as the community college hub. Those were the two things that really struck me in her lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, President Proctor, would you like to provide your key takeaways? Sure, I also would like to thank uh, the leaders across North Carolina for keeping this uh, tradition uh, alive in terms of the Dallas Herring Lecture and uh, the Chancellor, as well as the Belk Center and Dr. Edinger, uh, Edinger for her um, eloquent uh, lecture in terms of how she paints the picture of what it is our students and our communities are experiencing. Uh, as far as uh, to connect on the storm motif as my uh, fellow panelists uh, described it, I thought about what the bolt of lightning of the pandemic uh, represents. And uh, it's certainly a sudden illumination um, and it also destroys ignorance. So those who may think these inequities um, did not exist before, it certainly has shine, uh, shown a light on uh, what it is that community colleges were already called to do and now we're having to reform uh, even more. And so, uh, the structural or physical damage that comes from lightning in terms of our structures, uh, the strained social support to that fabric that Dr. Edinger talked about, uh, altered human connections, a mental health crisis. Uh, these are some things that I think um, we need to reflect on what kinds of supports we need to have in place to keep our students on track and help our community uh, retool uh, and reskill for the future. The thunder that comes after lightning, the loud cry of those disproportionately impacted uh, by the pandemic. And then of course, the light, that light that really um, 
points out the systemic structures that perpetuate poverty and systemic racism. So there are some uh, several takeaways uh, that I get from the lecture and seeing the community college as the vehicle to grow human capital. So I love, uh, you know, when uh, Dr. Edinger uh, says, get love from the hub, uh, we'll see ourselves as conveners uh, to um, foster that human capital growth in an ecosystem of different institutions, be it educational institutions, our employers, our community-based organizations, workforce boards and others, uh, so that we come together for our local communities as well as our state, and I would argue our national uh, economic development from a global competitive standpoint. Thank you, President Proctor. So if you could share, um, President Proctor, thinking about this need to change, how would you foster an institutional culture that cultivates agents of change who really recognize who we serve as community colleges? Uh, so, Again, on that storm motif, uh, we also have rainbows at the end, right, of a storm. And so seeing ourselves as providing that hope, uh, the place of promise Dr. Ed Edinger uh, uh, talked about. Um, and so we first need to know who we serve. So all of us have our institutional dashboards and those uh, you know, key performance indicators that we pay attention to um, in terms of retention, completion, and closing the gaps, but also there's some non-academic, non-higher ed pieces that we also need to examine. And so in surveying our students here at Harper, we learned on different dimensions around student financial security, basic needs security, and their perceptions of support that two thirds of our students are worrying about having enough money to pay for school, 46% uh, has said they ran out of money three times uh, um, or more times in the past year. And this was a pre-pandemic survey. And then 55% of our students have trouble getting $500 in cash uh, to meet an unexpected need. So knowing who we serve from a student standpoint, uh, knowing who we serve from an employer standpoint and the sector needs, and um, evaluating uh, what Pierre Bourdieu, uh, French, sociologist talks about as habitus. This doesn't get a lot of attention, but it really shapes what we do and how we respond to crisis or interventions or how we uh, develop new programs. And so what's the role of our institution in differentially privileging and rewarding students based on their possession of institutionally legitimized knowledge, values, and behaviors? We have to look at that um, and unpack that and move from that deficit narrative Dr. Edinger talked about to one of an asset-based approach in supporting students from where they are and getting them to where they need to be. Thank you. Dr. Serrata, thinking about what Dr. Edinger talked about in terms of a collective action approach to this work, how can community colleges embrace that collective act action approach in their communities um, as the hub to promote equitable outcomes? Yeah, great question. For, first, we must know who we serve. Who are our students, both uh, their data attributes, gender, race, ethnicity, PAL eligibility, first generation, et cetera. But we also, uh, we must also qualitatively know who our students are. As Dr. Edinger states, we must know our students in the context of their lived experiences, know their community and their histories and acknowledge their complexity. We must have a deep understanding and appreciation for who our students are and cease to see them through the deficit lens. Uh, I'll echo what Dr. Proctor just said. The simplest example is to not to determine if a student is college ready, but let us ensure that our community colleges are student ready. Then I believe that we must partner, I'll, I'll echo that as well, with all of the pertinent players in our respective communities, our independent school districts, our K through 12 partners, our university colleagues, business and industry, philanthropy, and develop shared outcomes and goals, including a focus on equitable outcomes and develop a mechanism of shared accountability via an annual transparent and public scorecard. And most importantly, we must stay the course and avoid initiative intoxication. We are initiative rich environments at community colleges, and it is usually us presidents who come back from a conference or a meeting with a new idea, 
Uh, this work takes time. Achieving the results we desire takes time. Uh, we've avoided initiative intoxication at EPCC by asking, does this new initiative enhance the work we are already focused on? If it does not, then we say no. And we've done this by implementing what Dr. Epstein, Dr. Pardon me, what David Epstein uh, in his book Range describes as slow learning. Slow learning is deep learning, and in order to facilitate success, it takes time to see these initiatives through. Thank you. We we often leave um, these conversations. Um, and you just mentioned the idea of coming back from a conference. So we, we leave these conversations always with what's the next question. So my question is to President Dietemeyer, what would you do differently based upon what President Edinger has shared with us today? Yeah, so I think we've started that work at Central Piedmont just as we were thinking about post COVID and, and her, her, her lecture today just amplified some of the things that we we're already thinking about. And to Dr. Serrata's comments, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, enrollment is down across uh, colleges. Uh, it's down across the nation. We know that it's impacted uh, students of color more than anything. You know, at Central Piedmont, you know, 86% of our students who uh, had to emergency withdraw in the spring uh, were students of color. And looking at the students who have not returned, uh, there's around 600, not 40 of those, 70% uh, of those are students of color. And yet we have a, a, a tremendous strategic plan that we have been very focused on. It's values-based. It's uh, It really does try to amplify what we've all been working on, achievement gaps, and making sure all students have both an access and opportunity to a better future. And so I have been very clear to say, uh, as Dr. Serrata said, we are not going to get, what did you call it, uh, initiative fatigue or initiative Inocula I don't remember exactly. Initiative intoxication. There you go. It was the it was the drunkard part I didn't uh, didn't identify with. But um, so I you know I've been very clear from the from the board all the way down to the faculty and the staff is that we we have already set a great agenda and rather than uh, move in a direction that is not you know staying very focused on our students or a majority minority institution we know where we need to go. Uh, as Dr. Proctor said, know your community. You know, that is very focused and came out of, out of um, what Charlotte experienced back, you know, when the Chetty report was released and in all the major cities across the country, uh, we were ranked 50th out of 50, meaning that if you're a child born in Charlotte and you were born in poverty, you were less likely to get out. And so we feel like we're very embedded in the strives of our community and we're gonna stay focused on that. And again, what has just happened in the last seven or eight months has really shown us that we need to continue in that work, be steadfast in it, and take the lessons that we've learned as we plan for the future. And as we are already looking out towards next fall, recognizing that the fall of 2021 at Central Piedmont will not look like it has uh, in recent history. Uh, how we offer courses, the timeline of those, and, and maybe who will teach those in what regards, and, and how we will staff those, and how we will think about registration and the student experience. Uh, those cannot be untouched uh, based on the work we'd already uh, kind of committed to, but the lessons learned out of this. Thank you. I want to take a question from some of our participants, and one is uh, from Zoom. Uh, the pandemic has made it even more clear that community colleges have been filling in the gaps of the broken social nets. Even as we continue to expand services to meet students' needs, is there a role for community colleges in advocating for major policy changes? And if so, how should that take shape? And I open that to anyone who would like to respond on our panel. Sure, I'll, I'll begin and then I'm sure the ladies will come in with, with much more astute um, observations with regards to this. Uh, absolutely, we know that, that our colleges have continued to be um, the investments from our respective states have continued over the course of time. If we look back all the way to the Great Recession in 2008 and that de investment that we've all, we've never quite caught up and here we are in, a, in another significant recession that we know is going to impact us. I'd say that we have uh, 
two areas that we can advocate on. We can advocate at the national level. We utilize AACC, among other sectors, uh, achieving the dream. Dr. Edinger is the chair of that board. Uh, AACC with Dr. Bumpus and his team advocating. And we've seen some results. We've seen uh, year-round Pell codified for our students, which is, is something that is, is very important. And then I think we have a responsibility. I feel that community colleges are the last bastion of democracy. And we have a responsibility to ensure that we are educating a, uh, a, a, an engaged citizenry through our students and ensuring that they have what they need to become uh, to become prosperous in their communities and to become future leaders in our community so that they continue that advocacy on behalf of the community college and higher education as a whole. I agree with that, uh, Dr. Serrata. I would also advocate that we work with our legislators uh, both at the state and federal level. And so um, just here at, in Illinois, I know that um, from my conversations with lead influencers in, the, uh, in our state legislature, we were able before the pandemic to actually get um, legislators' attention to put funding directly uh, for community college students, those of, uh, that are low income, to actually remove that financial barrier for them. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit and that uh, was placed on the back burner as the state is trying to figure out how to balance the budget and uh, from a national perspective, relying on some federal dollars as well in that regard. And um, some a, a bill that did not uh, move forward um, in terms of adjusting uh, revenue streams for the state. So how we work with our legislators, um, not only when in need, but also when not in need, so that they know the good stories and the success stories uh, of how we transform our students um, in you know, their lives, the community, as well as how we meet the needs of uh, the workforce and the sector needs. And once we uh, get legislators to understand the role that we play there, they often would come back looking for something to influence um, you know, legislation that would support our sector. Yeah, Dr. Jager, I'll just, because um, I know we have lots of other questions you want to get to, I would just amplify what uh, Dr. Proctor and Dr. Serrata said. And again, to Dr. Serrata, who's our chair of the AACC board, he, he's trying to be humble. He's doing a lot of great work on the national, national level as well. You know, for community colleges, especially in North Carolina, we have to think about our local legislative in terms of our commission, and then we have our state, and then that federal influence, which is really important. So when we talk about advocacy, it's not just about the financial aspect of it. We, in Dr. Edinger's um, lecture, we talk about the narrative of community colleges and, and how, how much we need to continue to try to strive to make sure it's a right message, that it's a return on investment. It's really the, the, the value proposition that it truly is and the impact, that collective impact that she talked about, not only in our local communities, but what we do across our states and then what co that collective impact of almost 1,200, 1,100 community colleges across the nation can do. Um, we do need to continue to try to harness the right message around what we do in our nation as a critical component of workforce training, uh, putting people into jobs that are so critical. We've seen that again um, as the pandemic hit, not only in our local communities, but across the nation. Uh, many community college grads are the students that are standing in the hospital as nurses at the bedside. Let's don't forget that. They're the firemen and the public safety workers that have held us together. They are the ones who have been, um, you know, uh, still in the restaurants. Many of those are our culinary grads. We forget those as well, and we could go down the list. And so our level of, of amplifying our voice in terms of our story and our return on the investment, and even since the, I'm not sure it's post-election, and I'm on a, I'm on a political detox, so I'm not sure exactly what's actually going on, but. Um, I will say even in the last few days, I've heard this is our time because there potentially is going to be somebody in the White House who, um, who understands community colleges better. And so I would just say to us, it is our time to continue to amplify our voice, but that let's don't let it land on one administration. Let's make sure that it lands on the 1100 of us that lead these institutions uh, to make sure we're telling the right story, not only for this administration, but we've got to continue uh, that voice uh, into the administrations, both locally and in our states and federally, uh, to really turn the page on the underfunding of our colleges. Well, you all are touching on a number of questions we're receiving, and this one is from Reach, 
which really um, amplifies what you started talking about, President Proctor, and then President Dietemeyer, you continued. Um, so maybe we'll start this one with President Serrata, and then if um, Proctor and Dietemeyer, you have additional comments. But the question is really following up on that. What does the message need to be for policymakers, both federally and on the state level, to encourage them to stabilize community college budgets during the pandemic? and really bolster their investment in community colleges moving forward? Sure, and it's a great question, and it's one that, that I think that my colleagues have touched on somewhat. Uh, from my perspective, the message is the investment, the return on investment. Um, our legislators, in particular during tough times, are always looking for what is going to be the largest return on their investment and what is going to accelerate the recovery. If you cut community colleges during the recession, you're actually going to delay the recovery. Um, because these investments, we are best equipped to provide and accelerate um, students through short-term programs, through traditional programs, into living wage jobs, not minimum wage jobs, and into careers. So from my perspective, the key, to, the key message to our, our, our delegations, whether they be local, state, or federal, is the return on that investment and the acceleration of, of the recovery. And I would add, if you think about uh, just the economic outcomes uh, for our country right now, in terms of at the individual level, those who are unemployed, underemployed, uh, we're the most nimble institutions that can uh, bring both our credit and non-credit uh, sides of the house together to uh, meet the workforce needs and really uh, maximize the return on investment that Dr. Serrata was talking about. Uh, we often are overlooked. And if you think about what companies have been doing in terms of setting up their own in-house training, right? So circumventing the academy, uh, we need to be sure that we're at the table, uh, that we're the conveners uh, bringing solutions uh, to problems uh, in an ecosystem uh, of the hub that Dr. Edinger uh, um, described. And then if there's a desire, which I heard an outcry for across the country in the last few months, to diversify the workforce, community colleges already have that diversity that's needed uh, that, uh, th that those institutions can tap into. So that's another layer of the message that um, I think is important uh, for us to advance. Thank you. about that message? You know, I think my colleagues hit on it well, and so I'll just give my time back for another question, Dr. Jager, because I know you're trying to get through. I can see all the ones coming through. So um, I do think, again, as I said, I think we just have to continue to show the return on investment. The, the numbers are there in terms of the number of students that we serve and those that we put to work. So it's, uh, it's about workforce. Well, this one's coming from Zoom, and it connects to Dr. Edinger's message about the significant systemic challenges that community colleges are facing. But you three represent you know, Texas, Illinois, and North Carolina. So if you had to identify what's the major challenge that your community college is facing while providing support to ensure student success during a pandemic. So, so I'll jump in first, and, and uh, the biggest concern I have, Dr. Dina Meyer touched on um, early in her comments. My largest concern is that this, the class of 2020, and their lack of participation in higher education. And I know there's so many challenges transitioning to a virtual, a com almost complete virtual environment. But higher education will play in a more instrumental role as we come out of this recession. If you look back, what, what's past this prologue, Dr. Edinger, I'm an English guy as well, so it all, all goes back to Shakespeare. So what's past this prologue and what you see is at the from, from the depths of the Great Recession in 2008 to pre-pandemic, there were about 12 million new jobs, new jobs that were created in our nation. 
99% of those new jobs went to individuals with degrees and certificates. We are a knowledge society. It will play an even more important role. And as we come out of this recession, it's going to be more important for our students to hold those credentials, our community members. And so we really need to ensure, and this is my biggest concern, is that we need to ensure the class of 2020 is not lost. And we need now to, to look at the class of 2021 and ensure that they participate in the academy as well. I'll go about it just a little differently. And that is, you know, um, we recognize that many of our students are flourishing in an online environment, but we also recognize that it's not for everyone. And that many of our students, um, you know, Dr. Ettinger uh, said, we are, our students are family strong and economically fragile. You know, what I would like to say is many of our students decided that everything in life, you know, the, the helping a student or a brother or a sister, or a family member learn from home took, took precedent or that third job to try to continue to have food on the table. And so they've stopped out. Let's hope those are the reasons we know that there are many. Um, so how do we balance, as we think about 2021, there will be a vaccine, we will come out of this. You know, we need to have hope. Uh, our institutions, the doors will remain open. And how do we balance the traditional versus the transformational? How do we continue to be relevant and deliver on what we say that we do in such a spectacular way to meet our community needs? and do that in a way that meets students where they are, right? Many of them need to be in a classroom. Uh, blended will always be here, our hybrid. We'll continue in some of those uh, new models that we've stood up and, and flourished in. But how do we do that in such a way that um, we can bring back those missing non-returners into a sense of belonging? Uh, how do we build back their trust? Those are the things that are keeping me up at night. You know, will they see the value of what we do now differently? And they need to trust us in a time and an era where they not only need to heal um, from so many things, but will they trust us? Uh, and we would need to remind them that community is the solid portion of our names. And that hub of all those um, components that we've put together to try to help them be whole uh, as individuals and support them before, we have to learn how to scale those. We have to put a tremendous amount of energy through our corporate and philanthropic partners, as well as ourselves and our innovative thinking to figure out how to scale some of the most successful and have the courage to put down and, and maybe celebrate in sunset those things that are not bringing the most value add. And so how do we do that in such a way to meet the needs of our true community and our true students that hopefully will return? Um, you know, we were all a little caught off guard we thought that when the universities had a bit of a hiccup um, and dorms just didn't seem to be the norm, that we would have this you know, t huge enrollment capacity because that's typically what happens in an economic recession. And yet that's not what happened to us. And so uh, we have to be willing to maybe think about our own delivery experience very differently. And so that, that trust factor and the healing component of our students is gonna be really important. I would agree uh, with my colleagues. Uh, one of the major challenges I think we're all facing, um, as Dr. Diamaya just said, is how do we convince uh, different stakeholders to value what we offer and also making sure that we're shifting our lens uh, to be responsive to the needs that are emerging. And so uh, we can't continue to do what we've always done and expect to get different results. Before the pandemic, we were facing a demographic cliff in terms of high schoolers, uh, the, the size of those classes coming to us are de declining. Uh, and so how do we make sure that we're serving the K-12 uh, pipeline, but also our adult learners? Um, and then of course, uh, the cost of higher education, right? So. Uh, as you said, and typically we would see an indirect relationship with an economic downturn and increased enrollments. We're not seeing that because uh, there are a lot of things that our uh, students in our communities are facing and lots of loss. And so there is a psychological impact of this that we must pay attention to as well and find ways to support our community. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dietermeyer, you touched on this in terms of the online environment and the conversation continues to be 
uh, vast and significant across both questions coming in, but just conversations we're having around, around that large technology divide among North Carolina citizens, but citizens of Texas, Illinois, and across the country, particular by socioeconomic barriers, as well as rural areas. And this divide creates an obvious barrier, perhaps now greater than ever in terms of college access and attainment. As most of our courses, you know, are being delivered remotely, can you share, you know, what you are doing to provide greater access um, to devices, to the internet, to online support, but also where do we go in the future to continue to meet what seems like um, a divide that continues to grow? And we'll start with Dr. Dietemeyer, but I welcome um, Presidents Proctor and Serrata to join in as well. Well, I know my colleagues have done some fantastic uh, things in both of those states as well, so I'll be brief. And that is, you know, um, first of all, to my colleagues in North Carolina, I think we have, we have stunned ourselves at our innovation in terms of making how, sure how quickly we were able to avail technology uh, and put that in the hands of our students when they desperately needed it in order for us to continue to serve them. You know, I think about just Central Piedmont, uh, you know, it, that rural urban uh, conversation is really new, is, is relevant for me. You know, I've served as a president in a rural community and I've served in a few others and now sitting in an urban core. Um, while we have great differences, some of our things, some, some, we have great similarities as well. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've put over a thousand Chromebooks in students' hands. We've put, gosh, almost, you know, 600 uh, or 800 hotspots in students' hands to make sure they had connectivity. I know that those same stories are sitting out there in our rural communities who are also struggling with broadband access and just the capability of a student to be online. So it's changed the complexities of our state. It has to change the conversation. Um, it, if we are gonna continue to deliver high quality education, then a device and connectivity is as, as important as a textbook was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And we have to have that real and relevant conversation that it's not just for who can get it or which community decides they're going to invest in it. It has to be a state, that collective impact, right? And then to, you know, as William sits on the AACC, you know, chairmanship and I do on the board and others that are listening in, you know, that has to become a national part of our uh, educational conversation. If, if that's gonna be a, a piece of, of the delivery, then, does it become a right to an ed, to a to to an, ex, an excellent education and we have to have that conversation so i know my colleagues as i said um, have some other great things to share but my uh, I, i'm just um, i'm in awe of what we've been able to do as 58 in north carolina to support our students trying to pause to figure out if uh dr serrata was going to chump chime in uh i you know i concur with those remarks. Uh, this is um, the question that's before us is whether or not it's a right to have this access. And uh, so we do need to advocate at the national level um, as well as locally and at the state level. Uh, what we did at Harper, um, again, from the lens of tr trying to know who we serve, uh, because of the survey that we conducted last fall, we were able to get a sense of um, financial needs of our students uh, and also technology needs. And so we had a Chromebook loaner program that we put in place. Uh, we also had hotspots that we uh, purchased for students. And um, when we surveyed our students again this fall, while we had a thousand ready to go in terms of Chromebooks ready to deliver to students, they were now saying, no, we're good there. We actually need uh, hotspots and graphing calculators. And so keeping our hands on the pulse, I think is important as we navigate um, because we know our students are changing, their circumstances change. Um, when K-12 did not uh, go fully uh, back to on-campus instruction, um, now they're dealing with educating their children at home and taking care of elderly or loved ones. and. So that dynamic changed. And so we adjusted as we learned more from our students. And then uh, one thing I think that's important to understand as well is how we serve our students online, right? So this technology and this digital divide that we're trying to bridge that gap, but there's also how we serve the students and then how we equip them to be ready for online education. 
Uh, I'll be brief so that you can get to another question as well. I, I echo everything that my good colleagues have mentioned. Uh, we we looked at, we're now getting ready to be close to 3,000 um, devices, uh, laptops, hotspots that we distributed to, fac to, to our own faculty and staff as well as to our student body. Uh, in addition to that, I think this is where the partnerships that Dr. Edinger described uh, in her lecture as well plays a key role. Um, we had surveyed our students and found out that 91% had reliable internet, 93% had access to a device. That's still 7% of, of, three, of 30,000 students that didn't. But the reason that so many did was the partnerships that we have with our school districts and the fact that a significant, uh, about 30% of our enrollment is now dual credit in early college high schools. And that school districts have had a concerted effort to provide technology to these students. And so that partnership assisted us where our students, so many of our students already had devices due to the school districts already loaning those. And then now we need to ensure that as they transition from ISDs and graduate from high school, come in. Uh, and I think that that's part of the FTIC issues. Is those students turn those devices back into the school districts and may have thought they wouldn't have them with the community college. And so I think that's a partnership that we can need to continue to expand. And high-speed internet in, in particular in rural communities is is now something that the state legislature, we're going into a session in January here in Texas. And this is bipartisan support that this needs to be invested in significant investments. Um, and it is the, um, the, inter the ISPs that are the concern, the internet service providers that are the concern and are they gonna back off to be able to allow these investments to provide this service that is so needed by our, our citizens of the state. Thank you all. Um, the next question, which is our last question before we provide some concluding, uh, we give you opportunity for some concluding remarks are, what opportunities do you see to drive the completion uh, agenda and equity initiatives in the next year, given our political shifts at the federal level? And are there specific policies or programs we should be collectively thinking about to make sure we're including in the conversation? And how about we start with President Serrata? So thank you for the opportunity. Again, it's been my, my honor to be a part of this panel. So you, connection and completion, I'm focused on four things that the institution has been the same focus for the last nine years, engagement, uh, partnerships and pathways, um, creating a college going culture and completion. And really those last two, and by the way, the acronym is EPCC. So my team doesn't forget those, but if you look at in particular completion, we've worked really, really hard at this. And this is the slow learning that I referred to earlier. That's not going to stop. We're going to continue to focus on that. And we've been able to um, triple our graduation rate in the last 10 years, double it in the last five years. Um, the key becomes how do we double it again in less time uh, without ever lowering the bar of rigor. We will never do that. The faculty understands where I sit with that. Um, in addition, we have, we have reduced time to degree um, from five years to four years in the last seven years, average time to degree. We've reduced average number of credit hours to degree from 102 to 79. And yet we know there's more work to do. So we cannot, in particular in times of turbulence and in times of difficulty, we cannot keep our eye off the ball. That is still um, the most important thing that we need to ensure we do. President Proctor or uh, President Dietemeyer, would you like to, and I'm happy to reread the question because those double questions make it difficult um, to connect all the points, but in terms of what opportunities do you see to drive the completion agenda and equity initiatives in the next year, given our uh, shifts in the political climate? And then what policies or programs should be part of that collective action as we move forward? Uh, so from a completion standpoint, I um, believe it's important that we look at um, what uh, Dr. Edinger talked about in terms of dismantling uh, negative narratives and um, also alignment. And so if I think about uh, how students progress from high schools to us or how they come to us from where uh, they're, be it they're working or not, they're coming to reskill, how are we aligning uh, the curriculum 
particular math uh, tends to be um, an area where uh, it's a barrier for students. And so instead of saying uh, you have to perform in this exit exam to move up, let's bring faculty together to look at how we actually align uh, the coursework at the high school to the college level work at the college and make sure that we're um, eliminating those barriers. We went from one fourth of students moving from a uh, DEVA to college level to more than 75% of our students moving uh, forward in a semester because of that good work uh, partnering with our K-12. Um, and from an equity lens, uh, this is people work and it's hard work. And uh, so, you know, building upon the sense of belonging that Dr. Edinger referenced in her lecture, uh, Dr. Maya Angeli talks about talked about people will forget what you said or what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And so we've got to be sure that we are uh, doing this work from a people and equity lens standpoint. And that means having some tough conversations um, in the institution and how we're going to um, distinguish achievement gaps versus ability gaps. Achievement gaps are often um, interpreted as gaps in ability, and it's not. It's about uh, the kinds of educational access points that uh, different groups have um, the privilege or the opportunity to engage in. So those are some things that I know that from a policy standpoint, we, we really need to impact the work that we do from a human capital development standpoint. And I'll bring this one home, uh, Dr. Jager, and that is that I'll, I'll come at it from something that I think we've really been pressing upon, and that's really a one college model. You know, we tend to think of ourselves in silos, what we do in basic skills, what we do in corporate and con ed, and then what we do on the curriculum side. And, you know, one of the things that we've certainly learned over the last, you know, several years as we've been working with Achieving the Dream and the Aspen Institute kind of in this reform mindset is, Students don't understand any of that, especially when we start talking about value, value, you know, credentials of value, short-term workforce certificates. And so it's the language that we use. And so we're really talking systems change. And so when we talk about advocacy and working with the administration, whether it's at the state or the uh, federal level, um, then we need to talk about systems change. And we talk, need to talk about the college and what that one college model looks like for students. And so we talk about we're, we're moving ourselves to where you come through one those open doors, but one door, regardless of what you come to us for, we're going to serve you right where you are back to where we started with Dr. Dallas Herring, right? But it's, it's about remembering that the majority of our students don't understand how to navigate the system of higher ed. They certainly don't understand the language we say and speak to them. Um, and so we need to think about that narrative. So we've gone to, you know, I, I say to faculty and staff, uh, we're going to be one college through with one mission and one vision operating through one set of values. And we're going to do that serving one student at a time, because as, as I think Dr. Proctor said, you know, this is people work and it's hard, um, but it is, it is, it is a blessing. You know, it's, I, I think Dr. Edinger had in there, it's, you know, it tends to be a heavy lift, but it is the greatest life transformation thing that anybody can get called to do. And so it depends on how you come at the work. And so I think as we sit down and have national policy conversations uh, with those who, who, who uh, enjoy what we do and can help amplify that, we need to make sure that we talk about, continue to talk about systems change and that our doors are still wide open, but that regardless of where that student is or who that person is and that they wanna uh, transform their lives, that we're the answer. Um, and we need to have that conversation you know, inside our doors as well as we try to invite students back in uh, to recognize that some of what we say and do to them um, pushes them away. And I think we've all acknowledged that. Well, I want to express my significant gratitude on behalf of the Belk Center and the College of Education for your individual reflections today, but also for what you give to your institutions and what your institutions give to the communities. My unending thanks. And I also want to offer a special thanks to Pam for giving us the opportunity to think critically today about both past and our present. Um, yes, major applause, even in this Zoom virtual world. I hope you can hear it, Pam, it's coming. It's coming from North Carolina, Illinois, Texas, and all across the country. So we thank you all for joining us for the lecture and response panel. And I will turn it back to Dr. Davis for information about how to stay connected with the Belk Center.
AJ. It has been a pleasure to work alongside a dynamic team who created this experience to reach a much broader audience than we have in the past. A special thanks to each and every one of you who joined us today. Many of you will engage in small group discussions right after we conclude here. Thank you for keeping the momentum going around this topic. Finally, we appreciate your feedback and hope you will take a few moments to complete our post-event survey. In the next few days, please look out for a message with a recording of today's lecture. We encourage you to continue this conversation using the discussion guide that we developed with our partners at Achieving the Dream. On behalf of the Belk Center, thanks for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you.